احسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم my respected brothers and sisters assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh jazakallah khair sheikh nab habib sheikh yasir for this opportunity may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor you accept you and bless you i have got less than an hour and i am going to go straight to the subject when i was sent to do phd in england university of wales my teacher dr hasan ashafi and ahmed al asal they got their phd from university of london and they advised me to go to bodleian library in oxford and see the muslim manuscripts the arabic and islamic manuscripts which were used by the 16th and 17th century english scholars to learn the islamic sciences and which were the foundations of modern civilization so as soon as i landed to the university my next trip was to the bodleian library and i was really astonished to see on one of those manuscripts the signatures of isaac newton with the date and on one of the others the signature from john locke so my journey for this book started in 1992 and the book was published last year so it took me almost 30 40 years to connect the dots and i am alhamdulillah very comfortable in making that statement that the modern america or the modern civilization even though it was developed by the judeo christians its find its foundations are islamic and without islamic tawhid islamic concepts there would have been no modernity no america and no modern civilization it's a very bold statement but let me start asking this question and maybe you can get some answers now you've got the picture in front of you can somebody tell me where is this picture from guess it simple <clears throat> anybody else no i am still in america this is the us basically library of congress the main dome of the library of congress now the founding fathers the american elites now this is a kind of reflection of what they believed america is depicted as the virgin civilization which benefited from the previous civilization so 14 civilizations are listed now if you look at the name judea and under it in the golden words is written that we took our religion from judea judea is the area of judaism from greece we got philosophy from rome we got administration and from islam we got physics now from the middle ages we got what the languages modern languages from italy we got fine arts from germany we got painting press printing press and from england we got literature so you will see that the american elites they believe that the physical sciences we took it from islam this is the irony that right now most of us we believe muslims have not contributed much to science and the biggest claim is made by the west that we have developed science and technology while the founding fathers and the original elites of america they believed that the physical sciences we got it from islam because the reason is there is a huge gap between the greco greco roman philosophy and sciences 
and modern civilization. For those 1400 years, the science, the technology, the philosophy belong to the Muslims. So this is what the founding fathers. Now, this is the famous picture, everybody knows it. Can you tell me about this freeze? <clears throat> Who will tell me? I'm sure this is a very famous one. Everybody shall know it. Which picture is that? Come on, guys. This is the US Supreme Court. When the Supreme Court justices, when they sit, this freeze is behind them. And what is the message? There are 18 lawmakers who are depicted there that the judges must know that the American law was derived from these lawmakers. And among them is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Can you see it? With the Quran and with the sword. So what was the message? That the American law, one of the sources of American law is Quran and Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, sometimes these right-wing Christians, when they look at that and they say, yeah, the founding fathers or the elites believed that the Quran contributed something, but look what they said, that Quran was spread by the sword. I cannot go into the details, but look at the sword which is in the hands of the Prophet The Prophet does not have the sword and the handle. What? He is what having the hand on the blade, and the sword is downward. What was the message? That he was very strong when it came to implementing the law. His sword was downward, but whenever he has to use the power, he used it for the implementation of law. As the Quran said, that we have sent the Quran, and then وَالْمِيزَانِ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْكِسْتِ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the hadith, power, so that we can establish the goodness. And that was the message that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu used it for the sake of establishment of law. Now this picture, who will tell me? Which building is this? Anybody? This is the Capitol building, U.S. Capitol building. So now you see Mamanides, Moses Mamanides on one corner, Musa alayhi salatu was salam, Napoleon. On the left corner down, this is my left and your right. Who is that with the turban? Suleiman. Sultan Suleiman al Qanuni. Sultan Suleiman, the lawmaker, the lawgiver. And who is the next one? Thomas Jefferson. Who was Thomas Jefferson? The third president of America, the writer of Declaration of Independence and also American Constitution. So now, what is the connection? Because Thomas Jefferson was a reader of Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni, how he made laws and how when he conquered Bosnia, you know, Bulgaria, Romania, how he treated the Jews and the Christians, because Thomas Jefferson wanted to establish a pluralistic society. So there was no model for him in the Christian heritage. The only model was Rasulullah Sallam and constitution of Medina, and based upon it, Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni, so he studied him so much that's where Thomas Jefferson is what placed next to him. So what is the message to the U.S. congressmen and women and senators? When you will make new law, look at your leaders like Thomas Jefferson and like Suleiman al Kanuni. Now let me ask you this question. Which famous masjid is this one? <clears throat> It's a historical so-called masjid. Can you tell me which masjid is this? Guess it. I am just try trying to increase your curiosity. 
I'm not testing your iman or your knowledge. Huh? So you chose Chicago. Chicago. See, Chicago. Those people who have lived there, they know it. So this is one of the buildings on 600 North Wabash Street in downtown Chicago. This was built as Medina Masjid in 1920. Right now, it is the Bloomingdale store, and half of it is now casino. But it was built as a masjid, which tells you, before you and me and our forefathers migrated in 1960s and 70s, there were Muslims here. They were building the masjids, and now those masjids are changed into different other structures, and I'll explain to you sometime if there will be time. Look at the door of that building. Even right now, when you enter the Bloomingdale store, this is what is written, La ilaha illallah, la ghaliba illallah. It is still written there. And you go inside and you will also see a lot of Muslim architecture. Now this is what is clear, la ghaliba illallah, la ilaha illallah. Which building is this one? Which masjid? Maybe the Sheikh knows this one because he must have visited when he visited us in Milwaukee. I will make it easy for you. This is nowadays called Tripoli Center. It was built as a masjid. And look at the dome. What is written in the dome? Can you see the kalima, la ilaha illallah, la ghaliba illallah? But right now, it is the Shriners Center. You see over there in the middle of the dome, the ayat of the Quran. Let me ask you about this famous building, and I'll make it easy for you. It's in California. Who will tell me? This is the famous Alcazar Theater in San Francisco. It was built as a masjid. Can you read over there at the top? Udkhuluha bi salamin amini. The ayah of the Quran. And then on the left side, La ilaha illallah or La ghaliba. Right now, it is the fame, famous theater in San Francisco. Now, let me ask you, where is the tallest minaret in America? Can somebody tell me? The tallest minaret in America. I will not test your <laughs> general knowledge. This is, it used to be the Algeria Mosque in Montana. And it is still the largest or the tallest minaret in America. But now it is the Helena Civic Center. It was changed into a civic center. Now, let me tell you, those who were before us, they were might Muslims, Unitarians, and this is some of their pictures, and I will show you a lot of that. This is the way they used to dress. This is the way, even you look at this picture, their woman, when they will have their type of hijab on the left side, you will see it was written, Allah, Allah, all around the corners. Now, here begins the story. My respected brothers and sisters, the book is over 600 pages, and I told you it's the result of 30, 40 years of research. So I am going to summarize. There might be a lot of gaps, so you can ask me the questions. As you know, the Umayyad Caliphate, Abbasid, then, mashallah, Fatmids, Mamluk, Ottomans, Mughals, Persian, and then even the Moroccan Empire, for almost 1,000 years, the Muslim culture was the dominant culture. So let's start from the 17th century. As you know, 17th century, England was a small island with population of 3 million, and it became 5 million in 1619. But the mighty empire was the Mughal Empire. Mughal Empire of India was the richest empire of the world. It was so rich that the word Mughal entered into the English language to represent 
if somebody is filthy rich, he is the Mughal of the town. Are you the Mughal of the town? Because the Mughal were so rich that to name somebody as the filthy rich, they started calling it Mughal. And when they earned the money from there and returned, instead of calling them English, they used to call themselves white Mughals. So England did not have money. Its economy was agrarian, weather was so bad, so poor people. And I can tell you that it did not have a standing army because the king could not afford to pay the soldiers. The Mughal army in 1629 was 4 million standing soldiers. 4 million were paid. The Ottoman Empire had 225,000 soldiers in the army who will be ready in one hour by the command of the Sultan. And they were so terrifying to Europe as nowadays when some of the children cry and the mother says, go to sleep, monster is coming. The historian, the British historian, they say at that time, when the children will cry, the mother will say, go to sleep, the terrible Turk is coming. So my respected brothers and sisters, the Persian Empire, the Moroccan Empire, they were the dominant empire. Now, in 1535, the king of France went against the king of Spain in war and was arrested along with his children. So his mother sent the delegations to Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni that if somehow you attack your enemy, the king of Spain, and get my children released, we will become your allies and actually your vessels in Europe. So Sultan Suleiman al Kanuni took those 225,000 soldiers, conquered Bulgaria, Romania, you know, Hungary, and went all the way to Vienna and besieged it. So this way he created a buffer state between France and between the Spanish kingdom. Then every summer the Ottoman fleet will go and protect France against the king of Spain. So from that time on, the French started working in the Ottoman Empire as you and me are working here in America. Now the Queen of England, Elizabeth I, when she figured out that they are protected by the Ottomans and they are bringing money and a lot of sciences back, so she wrote a letter to King Murad Sultan Murad, the son of Sultan Salim, saying that we are better Muslim than the French. Our Islam is far closer to you. We believe in one God. We don't worship idols. We don't worship saints. This Pope is kafir. I'm using my terminology. We are more Unitarian. Can you open the doors for us? Because we are so poor. Nobody wants us to treat or deal with them because we are Unitarians and they are boycotting us. So the Sultan allowed the English to start working in the Ottoman Empire in 1580. Here comes the story. And here you have to understand a little bit. In the Christian world, as you know, two world view, Trinitarian, that God is one in three and three in one. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, and Islamic worldview was God is one. So what was the problem? That everything was interpreted from the perspective of Trinity. As there are three persons in the heaven, there are three castes upon the earth. King represents God the Father. Nobles represent God the Son and clergy or priests, they represent God the Holy Spirit. So king, nobles, and the clergy, they are superior. The commoners or the laity, they are inferior, made by God. And they are supposed to serve those three higher castes. This is what was called three realms of estate. 
it continued in France, in Italy, in England till 18th century. Go back to French Revolution, these commoners, they fought those superior castes, and that's where these three realms of affairs were. And then the word was attributed that there are three kinds of animals, the animal of the sea, the animal of the air, and the animal of the land. Even blood, there were three kinds of blood in human body. One type of blood was red, other blood was basically kind of blackish. One was coming from the heart, other was coming from... So you can imagine everything was explained from the perspective of what? Trinity. Now, you look at these paintings, they are famous painting that the 98% people are down below, while 2% are at the top, and the king is at them, mashallah, they are ruling, and 98% are treated like the servants. Here is another painting, that those commoners are, what, like dogs, like, what, donkeys and the nobles and the clergy is riding over them. This is what Christianity, according to them, gave them. And look, here is another painting that one vote for the clergy, one vote for the nobility, and one vote, not even a single vote, for the 98% commoners. So this was the situation and if anybody will say, no, God is one, why there are three in one or one in three, they will be burnt alive. These are the famous pictures when somebody will say, why I have to believe in Jesus as God, or why the person who could not defend himself will defend me, or why the one who was crucified can be my God, they will be burnt, they will be called kafir, and these are the pictures of how they were burnt alive upon the stake. Now, here the story starts. When these people went to Ottoman Empire, and they saw that Muslims believe in one God, that same God, Ya yuhannasu inna khalaknakum min zakarim wa unsa wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna akramakum indallahi yatqakum, that all children are the children of Adam and all of them are equal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored the children of Adam. And then that's based upon when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blew into them the soul. So they started demanding equality. That we are not inferior than the nobles, we are not inferior than the royals, we are not inferior than the priests. We are equal. Second thing, because they were required to pay 10% of their income as a tithe to the church. So they started saying, no, we have become Mohammedan Christians. We will pay only 2.5% zakat. We don't want to pay 10%. Now the king was supposed to be divine right king that he is appointed by God he can make the law break the law, so whenever he will go to war, he will say, I am going to charge you war tax, 25%, 30%. So these people started refusing and saying, we are Mohammedan Christian. We don't believe Jesus is God. We believe Jesus is a prophet and a messiah, and we don't want to give you 20%, 30%. We will give you only 2.5%. So this way, they started calling themselves Muhammadan, and as right now, we are putting on the pant and the shirt and the ties. At that time, the dress, the dominant dress was the Ottoman. This is the famous British ambassador, John Finch, and I will give you some of the other examples. This is a famous painting. Over there, you look at Shah Jahan, the Mughal emperor is depicted sitting upon his throne, and the king of Persia is sitting next to him, closer to his knees. The Ottoman sultan is sitting close to him, but the English king, Charles I, is depicted sitting under his feet. So that was the king of England's position, 
when it came to the Mughal emperor. Here is another, you know, painting. The British princes, they used to put on the Ottoman Muslim dress. This is Queen Elizabeth I, Sultan Sultan Murad's wife. She sent her this gift and she used to put it on the day of Christmas, with hijab. So, and this is another famous ambassador. Now here is the Queen of England depicted having hijab and putting on Muslim clothes and sitting on the Ottoman sofa, being served coffee. Who is serving coffee? A black girl, Muslim girl from North Africa. Now we know Starbucks, you know, McDonald's, all of them are American. But you know, coffee came to England from Ottoman Empire, from Istanbul. When they went and started working, in 1650, they brought coffee, and in 10 years, it became so famous that there were 2,000 coffee houses in London. And they had the turban, as you have got the Kentucky chicken guy right now, that guy you see that at that time, the coffee house was the turban guy. I'll show you those pictures. So you will see that now, this is another painting that the white English girls putting on the Muslim clothes and learning how to serve coffee. So this is what is just to show you how dominant was the Muslim culture at that time. Now, when they went to Turkey, when they went to the Muslim world, they found this mathematics, this astronomy, this chemistry, this physics, none of those sciences were in England. So now, originally they brought the Quran, the Hadith, we are what? Muhammadan Christians, they were reading Quran, Hadith. But when they brought the sciences, the king of England became so impressed that he ordered that every businessman who goes to the Muslim world will not be allowed to come back until and unless he brings one Muslim manuscript. So this is Charles I. This is his famous letter. The king has also considered that there is a great deal of learning fit to be known written in Arabic and great scarcity of Arabic and Persian books in this country. Whereof he requires that every ship that company at every voyage shall bring home one Arabic or Persian manuscript book. This is what he called the knowledge text. So this way, I am going to give you now, this is the Bodleian Library, Oxford, I was talking about. This is what those thousands of Muslims' manuscripts, Arabic manuscripts. This is the Cambridge Rare Books Library. And you see those 16th century, it will show you that such and such Mr. Grievous purchased it, on such and such date, they are in Arabic, tells you the name of the person who purchased the date and the city from which it was purchased. This is the original translations. When they purchased it, they learned Arabic, they translated it into Latin. So you will see on the side translation on the, you know, different kinds of translations and they have got from mathematics to astronomy, kitab manafi utair, wa ilajat, how to treat the birds, basically zoology, botany. So there are hundreds and thousands of them. Kitab Euclides fil usul al handasa, the book of Euclid, as you know, in the mathematics. Subhanallah. These are the manuscripts, when I looked at them, I really felt, now there are uh, even the extraction of teeth, how to do the surgery to get the tooth out. And I'm sorry, my sisters, I'm not sure, shall I show the next one, even gynecology. So, and then 
the maps of the world. Where are the mountains? Where are the rivers? Where are the oceans? And English started using an al Qanun of Ibn Sina. You know, that was the book of, which was taught in the medical schools till 1950. That was the biggest curriculum in England. So here, let me explain to you, the vice chancellor of Cambridge University, his name was Jan Koval. He lived in Istanbul. He brought so many Muslim manuscripts and when he returned to England, the king appointed him as the vice chancellor of Cambridge University. Isaac Newton was a student in Cambridge University at that time. So his book was taught to Isaac Newton. Now you will see the teacher of Isaac Newton, his name was Isaac Barrow. He studied in Istanbul, lived there, brought those manuscripts and taught Isaac Newton from there. And when he retired, Isaac Newton became head department of mathematics in what? In Cambridge University. These are the handwritten notes of Isaac Newton over there. You see all of those calculations when they are translated. Now, here I can tell you, my respected brothers and sisters, many of them, they brought the money from there, the books, the sciences. When they came, they started calling themselves Mohammedan Christians. And you will see from 1640 till 1690, Quran, Allah, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, Turks, Moors, they were the most discussed topics in England. And if I go into the details why they were discussed, it will take me too much time. One is, the king said, I am superior. The pope said, I am superior. So the king said, look, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, combined the secular and the religious authority in him and Muslims are doing, that's where they are successful. We are fighting, the Pope says, I am superior, and the king says, I am superior, we need to follow the method of Muhammad. So that was the reason that kings wanted Prophet Muhammad's message. There were hundreds and thousands of white Muslims, just in the city of Algier. Martin Poo says, that in 1619, there were more than 200,000 white converts. Another historian in 1635 said that among the Turks, there were so many white converts that they were regulating the whole country. And William Davis, another famous historian, he said that there were more renegade Muslims or naturalized Muslims who accepted Islam from Britain, Holland, England, than the natural Turks. So, John Kowal, I just mentioned to you, the one who was the Vice Chancellor of Isaac Newton, he and Ambassador were invited to the circumcision of Sultan's son, which continued for two months. Parties, welcome. And one day, there were more Christians accepting Islam, and he said, we have not converted so many Muslims to Christianity in 200 years as they are doing it every day. Now, look at some of these pictures. Now, Mary, peace be upon her, is holding Jesus, but look at the crown of Mary. It says, La ilaha illallah Muhammadur. Rasulullah. So they even said, we believe in Jesus, we believe in virgin birth, but we are not, you know, the people of Trinity, we believe in one God. So coffee houses, you can see those pictures. This was the sign of the coffee houses. Here you can see those English sitting, enjoying their coffee, and the person who is making coffee is with the turban. See. All of these are the paintings in the British Museum. You can go. Now, many of them accepted Islam, 
And here is one of them, the famous one. His name was Henry Stubb. In 1674, he wrote a famous book, An Account of the Rise and Progress of Mohammedanism and a Vindication of Him and His Religion from the Calumnies of Christians, in which he demanded that if English want to solve their problem, just follow Islam. Bring Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu religion, apply it, make England a Muslim city, Muslim country, the problems will be resolved. John Tolan, in 1670 to 1722, he wrote so many books, one of them, Nasara, Nazareans, or Jewish Gentile and Muhammadan Christianity. So what they said that the Christianity which is followed in the Christian world is corrupted version. The original version which was revealed to Jesus, peace be upon him, was preserved by Prophet Muhammad So Muhammadan Christianity is genuine and the British or the Western Christianity is what? Corrupted. So that's where he wanted everybody to become Muslim. So Isaac Newton became one of those Unitarians. When the British crown persecuted them that you are Mohammedan, you are Paul.
any Mohammedan nation, it is declared by the parties that no pretext arising from religious opinions shall ever produce an interruption of the harmony existing between the two countries. Now, this is another story. Queen Elizabeth, who just passed away, till 1934. This is the picture of Queen Elizabeth in 1934. This is a whole different story. I will have to come back and give you. So many of them used to, do you know that in this city, in this country, there were more than 14 cities established as the city of Medina. In America, there are 14 different cities who were established as the city of Medina, seven as Mecca. And there are so many with Muslim name, Lebanon, Nazareth, Palestine. Now, one of them is very close to Chicago. The masjid I showed you in downtown Chicago was established as Medina Masjid. And the city was established as Medina. And the club where they used to meet and where they used to have was established as Medina Club and now it is the famous golf club. You see the minarets, you see the dome. The inside you will see mihrab and you will see and you will see la ghaliba illallah, la ilaha illallah all over. And the lake which is adjacent to that Medina Club where all of these golfers go and play it's called Khadija Lake. So Medina, Khadija, these were the names given to these areas. Now he, they, here are the states where the cities of Medina are there. 14 states. The cities of Makkah. Seven cities are called Makkah. And you have got all of these names in the different cities of America. All of this happened until the World War I. After the World War I, there was so much pressure, I will have to come back and explain to you all of those things later on, that things started changing. Everything was rewritten, and every aspect of Islam was obliterated. This is the book, Islam and English Enlightenment, The Untold Story. And here is some of the, uh, now, Michael Gillespie, you can call Gillespie or Gillespie, is the professor of political science and philosophy and authority on modernity. And this is what he wrote about the book, and I want you to read the last sentence. This is a book that anyone interested in stepping outside a Eurocentric view of the rise of the West and of the modern age must read. He is an authority on modernity, a professor of Duke and I really appreciate, and this is Professor Robert Schrodinger, one of the famous Christian scholars. You can read it. He said, Dr. Shah has produced perhaps the most comprehensive and deep analysis of the Islamic influence on the English Enlightenment ever produced. While Western scholarship presents figures like Isaac Newton and John Locke in cultural isolation, as if they develop their ideas in a complete cultural vacuum. Dr. Shah documents the deep and abiding influence of Islamic ideas on these and many other English Enlightenment figures. If you think the English Enlightenment was a positive thing, then you just might have Muslims to thank. Never before, to my knowledge, has the cross-fertilization of Western and Islamic ideas been so encyclopedically documented as it is here. In reading Islam and the English Enlightenment, you will never see the relationship between Islam and the West the same way again. Now, this is just for the sake of advertisement. Who will tell me who is this guy? Now, Dr. Sheikh Yasser, no, you know the person, so you are not allowed to mention the name. Who is this guy? Can you tell me? This is Bilal Erdogan, the oldest son of President Erdogan of Turkey. Because the book talks about the Ottoman contributions to the English, to the British, to the French and American. So, mashallah, he recommended the book to all of his 
MashaAllah contacts. And here, what I do is I go and meet with the movers and shakers. I take the book with me. I explain it to them. This is our governor of Wisconsin. I gave him the gift, MashaAllah. He has been reading and is very kind to have a discussion. There are a number of others, MashaAllah. The editor takes it all around the world. MashaAllah, young man, we give it. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me take it. Yeah. Yeah. So now it is the end of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from all of us. My respected brothers and sisters, most of us, we think that Islam has not contributed much to America, to modern civilization. Wallahi, without Islam, there would have been no science. I believe and I appreciate that for the past three centuries, they have taken it to the next level. They have done a lot. And nowadays, we Muslims are borrowing from them as they borrowed from us for so many centuries. So Alhamdulillah, we shall take from them, we shall learn from them, and that's where we are here. If our countries were developed, and if there were justice and equality, you and we will not be sitting here. So no doubt that right now, there's more equality, more opportunities here, and I am not denying the fact but I am just including Islam because they say Islam has nothing to do with modernity and I have proven beyond the doubt that without Islam there would have been no modernity. So therefore, this civilization, the positive aspect, not the negative, the legays and lesbian, those, I'm not talking about the immoral fuqsha and mulkarat, I'm talking about what is positive. Islam contributed a great deal to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give us the tawfiq so that we can revive our deen. May he bring the honor and dignity back to our ummah. I'll stop here. I'm not sure, Sheikhna, how much time we have. Do we have time for question? I'm sorry. I thought that I got enough copies, but then after the first presentation, Sheikhna, all of them were gone. So now I've got only few copies of this book, Islam's Reformation of Christianity. And I've got one or two copies of a concept of God in the Judeo-Christian and Islamic tradition. So if anybody wants to take it, I will sign it for them. But those, mashallah, give your name to Sheikh Yasir, and we will, inshallah, send it to him, and there will be plenty of copies, inshallah. My apology, I did not think that they will go like that, so I couldn't bring it. This was the most important for me, but unfortunately, I don't have the copies. So you can take the other copies, but inshallah, give the name to Sheikh Yasser and we will mail it to him, inshallah. Any question? Either you have understood everything or you have not understood anything, and I am happy with both scenarios. Zakumullah khair, mashallah. Oh, okay, okay, we've got some questions. Yes, please. Okay, now, okay, tafadl, young man. Young man, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Fadda, Bismillah. Go ahead. Um, you said you started your What can be so motivated? Because, I mean, you have to read the preface of this book. When I was a student in Pakistan and was studying science to become a doctor, I was frustrated that there was no Muslim name in the book of chemistry, biology, everywhere. So I started asking these questions. And unfortunately, Sheikh, now forgive me, I started watching these English movies. When I looked at Pakistan, underdeveloped. When I looked at America, everything fascinating. So I started asking this question, what Islam has given us? So my father got worried that I am getting too much into it. So he got, took me away from medical school and put me in the International Islamic University to save my Iman. So, and I started boycotting. I was half as in Quran, but never understood Arabic. So my teacher told me, Dr. Hassan Shafi got me, he said, you don't go to the classes. I said, I hate it. Then why you are here? I said, my father forced me. And he told me, you should have some kind of haya. You are half as in Quran. Do you understand it? I said, I don't understand it. I don't need to understand it. 
what Quran has given to us. And that's where, and Dr. Anisa Ahmed was the student of Sheikh Ismail Farooqi. So he took me to him. <laughs> and he said, what I said right now, that without Quran, there would be no America. There would be no modernity. I said, prove to me. He said, you have to study. So this is where my journey started. I went to England, and that was the incentive which carried. Alhamdulillah, now I am so proud that, Alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah, and that's what I want to share with all of these young people. Wallahi, we don't understand the ni'mah of Allah. Al yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al islam deena. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces Islam to us, He says, This is the greatest bounty, favor of Allah. But sometimes we don't understand it because this part of history we have not learned or we don't understand. So once our youth, our brothers and sisters will understand this part of history, they will become proud Muslims and you cannot take Iman away from them. I became better Muslim, proud Muslims after studying Christianity and Judaism. I came to know about the beauty of Islam and this is where that beauty is carrying me all over the world. Yes, sir. I don't think any of us knew this kind of information. It's excellent information, especially Thomas Jefferson being a Unitarian, you know. So my question is that have you been solving Have you been in trouble after writing this book? <laughs> Anybody send you a letter or something, you know? Actually, let me tell you. In the beginning, many of the Western scholars, they think I am making up these facts. They think, sometimes they say, who the hell you are? What is your authority? But they only accept it when they check the references. I can give you the example of one of the professors when I sent him the manuscript. He got very upset. He said, you are intellectual terrorist, <laughs> making up stories fabricating. But he went to the Bardeen library, checked the references, because there are 40 or 46 pages of references. He checked it and he was really fair enough. That's what I believe. These people are very fair, some of them. He came back and he sent me an email of apology. I apologize to you for being ignorant of my own history. So. Definitely, I think we have the choice, we have the chance. If somehow we talk to them in their own language, they will understand. This is the language they want to understand. So I hope that some of these young people can read some of those things. What I have done is just the ground foundation. These young people can take it more. These educated Muslims can take it more. I have been mostly focusing upon the movers and shakers, professors, I was not coming Shekhna to the communities. But then people said, I mean, if Muslims do not change, even if you change the movers and shakers, so try to make it simple. So this is what I'm trying to make it simple that so people understand it. But there's a lot of philosophical arguments. So I need help. Help me out, read it, you know, get the word across, do whatever you can. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us and make us the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ambassador of Rasulullah sallam in the and my brothers and sisters wallahi I, I want you to understand Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid Sayyidina Abdul Rahman bin Auf Sayyidina Abu Bakr they were successful people even before accepting Islam Islam did not teach Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid all of those military skills Islam changed his heart and he brought his expertise that is your role and my role. Through service, through proper sharing, with proper idiom, we share the message of Allah. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. Wajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadi. Hu wajtabakum. Wa ma ja'ala alaykum fi dini min harat. Struggle in the way of Allah as is appropriate to Allah's magnificence and sublimity. He has chosen you for that struggle. 
He has given you a religion which is so rational, logical that it can prove itself by itself. Millata abikum Ibrahim. He made you among the Milla of Ibrahim as if you have got historical continuity. Your religion is tested over centuries. It's not something new. Who was Samakumul Muslimina min Kablu Wafi Hada? It is Allah who called you Muslim in the previous traditions and in the tradition of Islam or Sidna Ibrahim called you Muslim. Why? And the Shaykh will explain to you La Mitalil Li Yakuna Rasulu Shahidan Alaikum Watakunu Shuhada Alan Nas. Why he gave you this religion of Islam, this logical Islam? Why he gave you the Milla of Ibrahim so that you can become a witness upon people? as Rasulullah sallam was a witness upon you. So my brothers and sisters, this is the ayah, the concluding ayah of Surah Al-Hajj. Remember, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the details about the manasik of Hajj, and then Allah concludes it with the ayah, Ya ayu allazina amanu rka'u, wasjudu, wa'abudu, wa'f'alu al-khayra, la'allakum tuflihun. Do ruku, do sajda, do ibada, do khayr, but that is not meant for itself. Your salah, your zakah, your ibadah is meant so that you become the witness upon mankind. Wallahi, after Ramadan and after this salah, our responsibility is not over with. Now our responsibility begins to take the message of Allah to those people. In firu khifafam wa thikala wa jahidu bi amwalikum wa anfusikum fi sabilillah whether you are educated or non-educated, whether you have got the money or not, whether you are light or heavy, go out and do your part. And here, mashallah, with technology, your masjid seems to be, mashallah, the Microsoft, it's like everybody's technology. I couldn't have done it, Sheikh Na, without. <laughs> and mashallah, look at, uh, look at our languages, look at our masajids, look at our opportunities. Wallah, we are zillion times better than Sahaba and resources. They had to go and fight to open a building or a city or to share Allah. Here we are invited and being paid. So we need to do our part. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use us. Allahumma ista'amilna wa la tasabdilna. Jazakumullah. Amin. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zulfuqar. SubhanAllah, I, I, a few weeks back, you know, when we met uh, um, uh, in Minnesota and I, and I heard him first time, SubhanAllah, speaking on the stage, I said, you know what, I have to bring him to the community. So, SubhanAllah, presented the, the opportunity for us. Alhamdulillah, it was a beautiful. So, Jazakallah khair for coming over here. We hope everybody can hear that message, inshallah ta'ala, and develop from it, bin Allah, what they can do to change the perception of Islam and Muslims in the world. Assalamu